Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Squalacci. I'm a professor of law at the University of Colorado Law School. We're here today in the moot courtroom of the Wolf Law Building, and I'm here to talk to you about public rights in water. I want to start with a short quote from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. He made this comment in a dispute between New York and New Jersey over the Delaware River, and he said, a river is more than an amenity, it is a treasure. And I want to emphasize today that it's not just a treasure, but it's a public treasure, and the public has rights to these treasures that we call rivers and lakes and streams. Let's begin by thinking about property. And we can think about water as property, but I want you to sort of compare water with land. We know that land, uh, when we own a piece of land, we have the right to exclude others from that land. It's arguably not the same with water. And today I want to tell you why that's the case. And, and let's ask two key questions about this. First, what rights does the public have to recreate on our waterways? And second, I want to talk about what right does the public have to protect and preserve the ecological and aesthetic values in our waterways? Let's start with the first one, recreational rights. And I want to here talk about both federal law and state law. And under federal law, we're going to talk about a doctrine called navigability for title. And under state law, I want to talk about public access rules that go beyond the doctrine that applies under federal law. So let's start with navigability for title. So when a state becomes a state, when it enters the union, it does so on what we call equal footing. And in this case, what that means is every state gets title to the bed of its navigable rivers and streams. And it's a title that's held in trust for all the people. If the state owns the bed of the stream or the lake, then the public has a right to use that stream or lake. It's state property. And remember, under our Constitution, and indeed under the constitutions of most, most states, that water is public property. And so the public has a right of access on all these navigable for title streams. Um, note that the definition of navigability for title is a fairly cryptic one. It comes from an old Supreme Court case called the Daniel Ball. And what the court said in that case is that waterways are navigable for title purposes if they are navigable in fact. And they are navigable in fact, the court said, if the waterway is used or is capable of being used in its ordinary condition as a highway for commerce at the time of statehood. That's the basic test. Now, you would think we'd have a lot of law on this. It turns out we really don't, especially here in Colorado. That's something I want to talk about here in a minute. But let's look at a couple of examples of navigable for title uh, kinds of cases. And so this uh, is an old picture. It's an old depiction of Lewis and Clark on the Missouri River. And, and this particular picture shows them at Great Falls. And there was a fairly recent case from the US Supreme Court that suggested that the area around Great Falls was not navigable for title, even though the stream above Great Falls and below uh, Great Falls was navigable for title because it was just not possible to navigate this uh, rushing water coming down over these rocks, right? And you can kind of picture yourself, you would not probably want to go over that water in a canoe at the time of statehood. I'm guessing that Lewis and Clark wouldn't uh, likely have done that. They'd have to portage around it. And, um, and so the court tells us basically that, um, that determining whether a waterway is navigable for title is a segment by segment kind of determination. So let's look, take a look at public access under state law. Now here, there are two different ways in which um, you can claim public access. Two different theories, I guess I would say, that different states use. One is just based on the simple notion that the state owns the water. State ownership can be a basis for public access because if you're floating on water, you're floating on state property. Indeed, the Wyoming Supreme Court has specifically made that holding. And they even said that incidental touching of the bed when you're floating on state property is part of the public's easement or right of access. So there are at least some pretty broad access rights in many states because if you're floating on water, you're floating on state property. Another way that states provide access, different way, is by adopting what sometimes is called a pleasure boat test. Some states have a slightly different test that they call log flotation. And so many states have taken the sort of idea 
that they can provide public access rights because running water is a common asset or resource. And then there's Colorado. And I want to spend a minute talking about Colorado because unfortunately, at least from my perspective, Colorado has what I think are some of the most restrictive access laws in the country. And it traces largely from this case from 1979 called People versus Emmert. And what happened in People versus Emmert is that Emmert and some friends of his decided to go tubing on the Colorado River. And they tubed on the river through some private property, and the private property owner called the local sheriff and said, some people are floating through my property, I want you to arrest them, and the sheriff did. They were arrested for trespassing uh, by floating through the private property. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Colorado, and the Supreme Court upheld the criminal trespass of Emmert and his friends. Note the picture, by the way. Um, this is a, a section of the river near where Emmert and his friends were um, arrested, and you can see it's a pretty substantial river. Is it capable of being used in its ordinary condition as a highway for commerce? I think you could make a pretty compelling argument that maybe it is. So worth thinking about, okay? I want to sort of emphasize one other point here about Colorado law, which is that we know that there is a lot of public access. Well, well how is that after Emmert, right? How do we get public access? Well, there are a number of ways which we can still have access to rivers. One is simply that a lot of our water flows through public land. And so if you're on BLM lands or floating on Forest Service land, you're on public property and there are rights of access to get onto that land. I should warn you that if you're floating on, if you put in on a public uh, uh, site, a public access point on BLM land, let's say, you could be floating through some private property downstream, depending on how far you go, and there's a chance you could be arrested for trespass. So bear that in mind. But but at least there's access, and by and large, I think many landowners don't bother people who are not sort of getting out of the boat and, and causing trouble. So there's, there is a kind of license, if you will, that some private property owners grant to other people to use these, uh, what they claim maybe is a private waterway. But given the Emmert case, that's what we have. There's also a possibility of getting water rights through the appropriation system, which you heard about in one of the other lectures. And so you can actually go to the state, go to the Colorado Water Conservation Board, which basically manages in-stream flows for uh, the state, and you can basically ask for a water right, maybe for a kayak course through your town. And many towns have done that, and this is a picture of the kayak course in the city of, of uh, Glenwood Springs. Okay. So let's shift for a minute now. We've been talking about public access, but I also want to talk about uh, the public right to protect ecological and aesthetic values in our waterways. And again, just as with recreational rights, I want to talk about both federal and state kinds of provisions that might help protect and preserve our ecological and aesthetic values. So let's start with federal law. Okay, and, and here there are a number of different theories that we might use to, to protect water rights or to, to sort of hold water rights that allow us to protect and preserve these ecological values. One is just by protecting landscapes. Another is by using various wildlife laws to protect water for wildlife. And I, I wanna talk about uh, both of those. So let's start with federal rights and land and landscape conservation. And, I'm, and here I'm going to be talking about something called the Reserved Water Rights Doctrine. The U.S. Supreme Court has told us that when the federal government, usually the U.S. Congress, sets aside land for a particular purpose, it implicitly reserves sufficient water to carry out that purpose. So when the government sets aside land for a national park or a wild and scenic river or a national wildlife refuge, and those reservations require water in order to make them work the way that Congress intended, Congress doesn't have to say anything about reserving water. It just happens automatically because water is needed to protect that particular landscape. And so this is a powerful way in which water rights might be protected, uh, in, at least in the context of these public lands. This is part of what we call the reserved water rights doctrine. Okay, Here's a great example of a case that happened just a few years ago in Colorado and it involves the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. And 
The Black Canyon of the Gunnison has reserved water rights because that's part of what makes this park so special, uh, the canyon and the water resources in the canyon. And there was an interesting thing that happened with this park. The uh, federal government during the George W. Bush administration decided that it was going to reach a settlement with some agricultural water users that would uh, what we call subordinate the park's rights to agricultural rights. What that meant essentially was that the priority that the park had, which was based on the date that that park was set aside, would be subordinated to some what would otherwise be junior agricultural rights. And so if there wasn't enough water for both, the ag users would get their water and the park would get nothing, even though the park legally had a prior kind of right. And some environmental groups brought a lawsuit and they won. And it was an interesting case because the court said only the Congress can give away federal property and federal reserve water rights are federal property. And you can't give them away, at least not without congressional legislation. Okay. Let's talk about water for wildlife for a minute. And there's a lot we could talk about here. I could spend uh, probably an hour just talking about this topic, but I want to, I guess, highlight a couple of issues on wildlife. First, note that when you're setting aside things like wildlife refuges, you may be able to reserve water under the reserved water rights doctrine for the wildlife in that refuge. But there are some other doctrines that might help us here as well. And most of these come under the Endangered Species Act, a somewhat complicated law, but I just want to tease out a couple of ideas from the Endangered Species Act. And one of them is that when Congress lists a species as threatened or endangered, it typically sets aside lands as critical habitat for those species. Okay? And, and while the law here is not entirely clear, I think there's a good argument that just like the reserved water rights doctrine, when the agency designates critical habitat and water is needed to have that habitat function properly, the water is reserved for that kind of purpose. There's a really interesting case that I wanted to sort of just mention to you involving whooping cranes on the North Platte River in uh, Nebraska. And it, the conflict really came between Wyoming and Nebraska because Wyoming wanted to build a reservoir on a tributary of the North Platte River, the Laramie River. And the problem was that the, the uh, reservoir was going to decrease the flows on the Platte in a way that could have harmed the critical habitat of the whooping cranes and thus harmed the whooping cranes themselves. And there was a big dispute and a big lawsuit over this that was finally settled, thankfully, and it was settled in a way that preserved adequate water for the whooping crane and, by the way, for the sandhill cranes as well, which congregate uh, along the uh, Platte River during, during the migration season uh, that some of you perhaps have visited during the uh, sort of March-April period of time. So let me say a few things about the Endangered Species Act. This is a pretty complicated statute, and I'm only going to scratch the surface, but let me just say a few things. First, there are a couple of provisions in the law that are worth noting in the context of water resources. First, the law applies to species that are listed under the statute. We talk about listed species. So there's a process to go through to, them, to get them listed. So the fact that a species might be endangered based upon some biological report is not enough. It actually has to go through this government listing process. But once it is listed, then there are certain protections that apply. And the two that we should know about here are the prevention of jeopardy to that species as the result of federal actions and the prohibition on taking, and I use the word taking in quotes, of any listed species by anyone, including private actors. So let's just tease those out a little bit. First, the jeopardy provision. What the statute says is that when a federal agency is taking an action, it cannot take an action in a way that jeopardizes a listed species or results in the adverse modification of its critical habitat. And there's a whole process that the statute sets up to make sure that this doesn't happen. And you can imagine that during this process, it may be shown that you need to keep some water in a stream or a river or a lake in order to protect or preserve those species, in order to prevent jeopardy to the species, right? And so that is one way in which the Endangered Species Act can directly affect water rights. And in fact, there are a number of cases where this has happened. 
Okay? And I just want to close by mentioning this, this concept of a taking, because what's interesting about the taking prohibition, as I said, is that it applies to private actors. And so if a private party is using water in a way that is adversely affecting a species, they can be held liable for a taking. And this word taking is very broadly defined, even to include harming the species. It's a complicated definition of harm, but it's a very broad definition as well. And so if you're taking water out of a stream, even water that you think you have a legitimate property right to take, but taking that water adversely affects a species, you may be liable for a taking. And I should add there are potentially not only civil fines, but criminal fines and even jail time for deliberate kinds of takings of listed species. Thanks very much.